Thank you. Uh, hello, all. Uh, welcome to another episode of Directive Stories. This is your host, Raj. And today we are joined by uh, one of our special guests in the field of social work uh, and also one of our colleagues, uh, Sneha. Uh, so let's see. Um, uh, in terms of um, mental health space, we have our special guest as Madeline um, Maldonora. Uh, she's also a mental health professional for over two decades. And uh, when it comes to healing America from the inside out through structure, structural change, uh, let's see what it takes to um, uh, be a mental health professional and also uh, help the community. Uh, Madeline has been uh, in this field uh, for over two decades, as I mentioned, she was into consulting. Uh, she was also, a, she has got an extensive knowledge on building and running social programs that have benefited uh, many recipients. Uh, she, her focus includes uh, assessment and diagnosis of mental health, um, also policy uh, development, clinical supervision and professional development. So she strongly believes in making the behavioral health system stronger from within by imparting uh, her extensive knowledge to her clients on how to navigate the behavioral health system while keeping their own mental health intact. So Madeline, thank you for accepting our invite to be one of our special guests for this week. And uh, over to you, Sneha, thank you so much. And probably we can begin uh, by, uh, by asking you to introduce yourself uh, definitely we accept for the fact that um, I may not have done justice uh, introducing you in the best possible way, but you can start off uh, sharing your journey, um, like how did you become social worker and all that. So over to you, Sneha. Thank you so much, Madeline. Uh, so, yeah. Hi, Madeline. Uh, it's uh, such a pleasure to have you here. So, yeah, uh, our, uh, we, we love hearing stories at direct shifts and we want to know what your life so like what what uh, started you on this journey what inspired you on this journey towards you know social work and why this career path thank you both uh, sneha and raj for uh, the warm welcome and raj uh, that was a lovely introduction uh, i don't think i could have done better myself so what got me into social work um looking back when i was about eight years old I remember I watched uh, the news with my dad and I also read the, the Daily News and New York Post, which he brought home every day. And I just remember really being affected by what I was seeing in, in the papers. And you might say, oh, you're eight years old. How could you? Well, I had a very high reading level. So I actually could read the newspaper at eight years old. And I, we were in the middle of the crack epidemic in the 1980s and also the HIV AIDS epidemic. And there were homeless people everywhere. And I remember looking at these things and just feeling like this pull in my heart. Like, I want to do something about this. I want to, I want to help the world. I want to save people. And so, of course, my dad is like, yes, yes, daughter, you're going to do that. He didn't think, you know, anything about it, but it stuck with me. So on a, on a deeper, more spiritual, philosophical level, I think this is a calling. I think this is something that I was born with and um, was always meant to do. And when I was 16, I worked in a supermarket and I started noticing that the customers would talk to me. So people bring, you know, bring in their groceries. I would ask them, how was your day? And are you okay? And they would actually start telling me things about their lives. And the next week when they came back, they would tell me more. And I think that was the, the moment that I realized that I was able to connect with people and that I needed to do a career that allowed me to do that. And social work really became that path. Um, that's that's amazing. I yeah yeah. Uh, so to you would be uh, so in our world and especially in America, there's this hyper individualistic pull yourself up by the bootstrap sort of mentality, and I feel like uh, we as a society often expect people to you know just get over their mental health issues themselves. Uh, we expect the change to come from within, but do you think? Like, and yeah, you, I'm sure you don't think that's how it works. So how do you combat that narrative in the way you work? Well, I've, I've learned from 
you know, 20, two, two decades of, of doing this work that depression, anxiety, and every other type of mental illness is not something that only happens to particular people. And once I realized that it is something that could happen to anyone, including myself, it, it has allowed me to really see and understand that mental illness is not a weakness. It's not a character flaw. It's not just because of the way that you were brought up or because you, know, you lived in poverty or had um, difficult experiences in your life. It, th there's a lot of factors that come into play, but the most important thing is that depression and anxiety, post-traumatic stress, all of these mental health problems are actually fairly common. And I think that the, the COVID-19 pandemic really uh, has, shown, has shown us this. You know, people who have never had mental health problems are now seeking mental health services because of depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, and a host of attention deficit disorder. All of this working on Zoom has really uh, brought out difficulties in people's focus and attention. So I think that we're, we're seeing as a society and as a world that no one is immune to mental health, just like no one was immune to the coronavirus. Anybody could get it. It's the same way with mental illness. Mm -hmm. That is true, that is true. Uh, again, um, this is something which is universal, uh, not only in America, but again, every human out there. That's great. Uh, thank you for putting it in the best possible way, Madeline. Yeah, Sneha. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, in your uh, work, you, fail, you have to, you're um, going to face a lot of challenges, especially when you're, you know, going against the system and like working from within the system. Like what are all the challenges you face, like from within the system as well as from the people you meet uh, on a daily basis? I always say that the clients, are the easy part of the work <laughs> because the clients are looking for help and they're mm -hmm. aware that they need help. And they're, mm -hmm. most of them are open-minded to the help. It's, yeah. it's the actual mental health system that we're within. Um, the bureaucracy, the, the challenges with accessing services for clients that need more than just mental health. Um, you know, no one is, is in a vacuum. Uh, meaning someone may have depression or let's say anxiety, but they also have other things that they need help with. They may have medical conditions, they may have housing issues, or they may have financial problems and need assistance with these things. Treating their mental health is, is my specialty, but trying to connect them to other resources can be very challenging, especially in New York. There's just not enough. There, there's not enough. There's not enough um, House, affordable housing. There's not enough uh, health care. I mean, you know, I have clients that we send them for an appointment, you know, for a, a test, let's say, and they're given an appointment for three months, let's say to see a neurologist, three months, sometimes six months later. So it's Whoa. not fast. It's not easily accessible. Um, you know, getting low cost dental care. Some of our clients, you know, really have uh, self-esteem issues because of, you know, poor dental health. Teeth are important, you know, in our society, we, we measure beauty and, and sometimes a person's whole personality by their smile. And so when a person is not able to access dental care or they can access it, but they're on a wait list for an appointment for nine months or a year, it, it's really stressful. And, and that's probably the most challenging thing, trying to get resources for clients when there's not enough resources to go around. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure it's super stressful. So like, and uh, this whole year has been super stressful for all of us. So we would like to learn from the experts. So how do you deal with that stress? I deal with the stress by reminding myself that I am a person above mm -hmm. anything else. I'm, I'm just Madeline. You know, you see the, the degrees and things on the wall, but at the end of the day, when I leave my office, I'm, I'm just Madeline. And, you know, I try to do things that feel good for my, for my spirit. Um, you know, I, I'm a, a spiritual person, so I pray, I meditate, I read the Bible. Um, I also try to do things that are fun. You know, I, I, I have an inner child inside of me that is always going to be five years old. And so that little Madeline likes to do adventures. You know, what, I recently went to Morocco and I was ATV riding in the desert and, you know, just 
loving just the speed, the freedom, the wind. Um, you know, when it's warm, I like to be near water. Water is very soothing. And when I'm home, I read. I read a lot. I watch uh, comedies and things that, or, or hopeful, uplifting types of uh, movies and documentaries. Things that feel good. So, mm -hmm. and also sleep. A lot of us in this profession don't get enough rest and sleep. And I'm, I'm guilty of that too. So mm -hmm. when I really need self-care, I allow myself to sleep late and I will not feel guilty that I don't, you know, get up at nine or eight or seven in the morning. I'm going to relax and have a, a lazy day. Okay. And also Madeline, like the mayor, the way you mentioned um, the affordable healthcare uh, is something which is not um, present in the current situation because uh, there is a delay. There is a delay in terms of um, uh, putting the health in terms of getting the care again, uh, be it in terms of health care or uh, putting the care back into health um, is something which is the need of the hour. And uh, post-pandemic, it's different because, uh, again, um, it could be the tests which, which, which are going on, the ongoing tests, or it could be the vaccines. Uh, people need to get their... Uh, certificates that they are um, negative. Uh, there's, so, there's so many things involved, uh, which is again, adding fire to the fuel, like the way you mentioned, people have to wait three to six months down the line. Thank you so much for sharing uh, everything which you had been through in terms of personal space as well, like uh, how to beat the stress. In fact, that's what uh, many therapists out there need. So, um, Again, this reminds me of uh, therapist counselors who also need uh, support from other therapists and counselors. There's lots of burnout, physician burnout, but thank you for sharing that insights. Um, over to you, Sneha. Uh, so, I mean, you're in this, you're in this field to make changes, right? So what are the changes in policy and uh, the system that you've made that you're the most proud of? And yeah, what are you working on now? Um, I was part of uh, developing a groundbreaking program that uh, didn't exist. It was mm -hmm. uh, created in response to a report from the Centers for Disease Control that Latina adolescents were the most at-risk group in the United States uh, for suicide. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this was in the early 2000s and uh, I was with an agency that um, had a Latina it's a CEO and she got a few of us together and we wrote grants to the federal government and were able to secure funding to develop a program for Latina adolescents here in New York. That program has been expanded to uh, all five boroughs now and is still in place um, all these years later. And we have helped hundreds and hundreds of girls who otherwise could have um, hurt themselves or actually committed suicide. So that's been, you know, something I'm really, really proud of. And um, I've also trained and, and informed a lot of therapists about the benefits of cognitive behavioral therapy for our clients. Um, in the past, we had a model that allowed us to just see clients long-term for many, many years. You know, Medi Medicaid and Medicare regulations have changed. So even with Medicaid, you cannot just continue to see people in an unlimited manner. Yep. Like I said, resources are less. So we needed a style of psychotherapy that would help people in a shorter period of time. And so I, I learned how to do CBT, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, and trained staff. So I brought this to several clinics where I was the clinical director. And I, I taught them how to do this in the most efficient way possible. And they've continued to do this with clients. And so that's something that I think is just amazing because you know we, we've helped people and been able to see more people because we were more efficient with the clients that we had uh, in treating them in a faster manner. And um, I've also done a lot of work with uh, integrating mental health and, and addiction, substance abuse. You know, when I first started in social work, these were seen as two very different problems. So if you had a substance abuse problem, you had to go to a substance abuse clinic or a specialty center you could not go to a mental health clinic, even if you had mental health problems. So one of the things that started to shift was clinics being more willing to accept these clients with dual diagnosis. And I, I was 
one of the people that was most willing to do that and to encourage my staff that we could treat people with dual diagnosis and safely. So, um, you know, I've seen a lot of people that uh, had given, given up hope of recovering from addiction. And because we were able to treat the underlying problem, which was the PTSD or the depression, they actually have recovered. And some of them even keep in touch with me nowadays. They find me on LinkedIn and let me know they're doing well. <laughs> so it, it's a good feeling. That, that must be amazing. So like, what is there like one story in particular if you're, you know, if we can hear about it, is there some story in particular that you're super proud of and are you willing to share with us? Yeah. Uh, about a client? Uh, yeah, is that? Yes, yes. Um, there's a client that I will never forget. Um, he, he came to this country from Cuba on the uh, boats. Uh, you know, he came on the little, on the little boat. And uh, you can imagine coming from Cuba <laughs> in that manner. He, he, there were a lot of people who passed away. Everyone did not make it. And he saw things like, you know, people drowning and being attacked by sharks, things like that. So when he got to Miami, um, I think he had a, a psychotic breakdown and he was homeless for about, well, he told me he was homeless for about 20 years, living under bridges. He would find some work and construction, but when he left work, he was homeless. He, he didn't trust anyone enough to have an apartment and live next door to them. This was part of his um, psychotic beliefs. And so when I met him in New York, he was, he was homeless here. And uh, he was partially deaf in one ear and he had uh, paralysis in some of his fingers from injuries that he had obtained from fighting on the street. And one of the things that allowed me to help him was that I allowed him to speak loudly and I wasn't afraid of him. He's a very tall man, spoke very loud, you know, spoke street slang, you know, intimidating to a lot of people. And I was just like, I can't focus because you're talking so loud, but I want to help you. And I realized that he was psychotic, you know? And so I got the psychiatrist to see him that same day as an emergency. And he was able to get him prescribed uh, medication that same day. And the client started taking them. And within one week, his demeanor was completely different. He was, he was lucid. And that client never missed a session. He came to see me every single week for about two years. And wow. yeah, and you know, he used to tell me, you know, he said, I'm an antisocial person. I've been in jail, I fight. I don't know how to control myself. And we worked through those things. And one of the most beautiful things is that through our work together, he started becoming a social person and connecting. And wow. you know, what, one of the things he used to do is he used to bring me a banana or an iced tea and I used to say, why are you bringing, you know, you can't bring your therapist presence. And he said, no, I know you work very hard and I know you must be hungry or thirsty. So I'm going to bring you a banana or, or a tea. And I used to say, well, if I say I don't want it, that's actually not therapeutic because he's showing empathy and care for another human being. And so with time, I started seeing him clean up. He, he allowed me to get him into the shelter system. And although it was very stressful for him, he, he stayed, he cleaned up and he was just a, a different human being. You know, he was able to see the things that he did in his life. He was able to hope for the future. And the last time I saw him, because I, I left that, that agency, he was on the waiting list to get his own apartment. So he was actually doing very well. He also had not used alcohol because he used to self-medicate with alcohol when he was homeless. So this was somebody I'll never forget because the, from where he started to how he was in the end, amazing transformation. And it and, just reinforced for me that if you invest in people, they're, they're worth it. And when you say Madeline, uh, he, uh, he was consulting, um, uh, I mean, he was into therapy and he never missed a session for over two years. Was it like weekly or daily or how did that happen? It Monthly? was weekly. It was weekly. Um, and that's another thing that isn't always possible because of how overbooked and overwhelmed therapists are here in New York. Sometimes it's not possible to see a therapist weekly. Sometimes it's every two weeks. But he was somebody who I consider to be so high risk. 
that I was seeing him weekly. However, I had to make that happen. Was it like a 30 minute session or one hour session? Uh, because I, I saw only therapy mm -hmm. in movies um, sitting here yeah. in India, yeah. though our company is <laughs> headquartered in New York. Mm -hmm. um, at Direct Shifts, again, as I mentioned, we help clinicians connect to employers. We also help therapists, counselors uh, get their uh, kind of jobs or whatever they need in terms of locums or locum tenants. Uh, yeah. So was it like 30 minute sessions or one hour sessions? In this particular clinic, they had a 30 or 45 minute module. Oh, okay. um, yeah, I mean, they preferred 30 minute sessions, but, you know, I, I'm the person that is in the room with the client. And if 30 minutes is not enough. I've, I've always been willing to run over and I'll just run a few minutes behind schedule because I think that it's more important to treat the person. Um, okay. But that's one of the challenges of um, the mental health system that they have this model now with insurance companies of 30 minutes. And when you think about 30 minutes, that's really not a lot of time. And, mm -hmm. you know, in private practice, there's a one hour model. But again, a lot of uh, insurance companies do not want to pay for an hour. So you're either doing less time or you're charging the client out of pocket, which is not possible for every client to just pay. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yes, yeah, Neha, you may continue with the flow. Being hopeful for the future. So what are the changes you would like to see in the system in the future? I would like to see it be easier for people to access mental health services. Um, I think that because there's still this separation between uh, physical health and mental health, it, it's two systems. When in all actuality, it really should be one, one well-run system because men, the, the head is connected to the body, as I say. So I don't know who invented this concept that mental health is over here and physical health is over there, but that's, that's part of the problem that they don't, these two systems don't talk, they don't connect all the time and they should. So mm -hmm. I, would, I would love to see some, some merging of those two systems in the future. I would also love to see um, insurance companies being willing to take away these limitations, uh, you know, stop counting the visits that somebody has for mental health. If they have a hundred visits a year, they need a hundred visits a year because no therapist is going to continue to see a client unnecessarily when you have new clients calling you every day that you can't see because your schedule is full. So we don't have a motivator to see people that don't need help. So it would be wonderful if people could just get the help that they need without having to go through so many hurdles. Um, I would love to see also a higher reimbursement for what we do. The, yeah, rates, the rates for therapy have not changed in more than 10 years. The cost of living has gone up how many percent, but we're still getting the same pay you know, scale from 2010, maybe even 2005. And those things really affect the amount that an agent, a nonprofit agency is able to pay social workers. So now you're competing with, you know, direct shifts is trying to connect clinicians to employers you're competing with clinicians who feel that maybe it's better to try their hand at private practice or even a different field because mm -hmm. they can't make an adequate living as a clinician. You know, some of us do. I've been, I've been very blessed. I do. But some of my colleagues don't or they have to work two jobs to make a, a good enough living that they can pay their bills and, you know, have money left over for, for certain things. So I, I think that if they could make fairer wages uh, for social workers, it would and therapists in general, it would be a game changer. And also, Madeline, uh, what about uh, teletherapy? Like, is is that as effective as uh, in person visits? Or um, what's your um, thoughts on that? For the clients that like the the idea of teletherapy, it's, it's the same. Um, I've done teletherapy now throughout the entire uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and you can connect the same way with a client. And actually, sometimes it's even better because I've had clients show me their home or show me what they're doing. So it's allowed me to be in their world instead of you know just them talking about it like they would in my office. For some clients, they don't like um, 
teletherapy, either they, they just are not comfortable with technology and we all know people like that, or for them, they, they don't have the technology necessary to make it effective. You know, they have slow Wi-Fi or they have an old phone. So it's not a good experience for them. But for the average person who has a decent phone or a tablet or a computer, decent Wi-Fi, and they're willing to have a quiet space in their home and some headphones, we can, I'm, I've done teletherapy in someone's car. You know, they said, this is the only place I can talk without my family knowing. I said, I don't have a problem with the car. You know, I'm fine with it if you're fine with it. So it, I think it's, that's allowed therapy to be more accessible to a group of people that maybe could, could not have accessed it before. Because the yeah. beauty of teletherapy is you can do this during your lunch hour now. Or, you know, you, can, you don't need two hours to, to go to a therapist and commute. It's, it's shorter. It's quicker. So there's also more, better attendance because of it. Yeah, I guess that could be also one of the changes we might be able to see in the future. Um, teletherapy need not be in uh, a box office. Uh, it, it need not be in an uh, official environment, but it can be more friendly, more human. I mean, as long as the connection is established and uh, the healing process is developed. And the way you put it across, like uh, be it mental health is not one part of the body and physical health, but if you have a pain in the knee or if you have pain in the back, uh, we'll not have a peace of mind. The same thing with uh, a, a patient. It could be with anybody out there. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Madeline, um, again, for being more vulnerable with whatever you do with the clients. Yeah, Sneha. Uh, so there definitely will be, um, there's a, maybe a, maybe not as much now, but there's a stigma attached around mental health and people are like locked in to reach out even about their own mental health. And how do you like, um, how do you deal with that? And how do you, you know, ease people into therapy? Like, how do you make people feel comfortable? Yeah. How do you fight against that 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 stigma? Well, there there's two ways um, that I've used. One mm -hmm. is by doing things like this. Um, I think one of the fears that people have is that therapy is this big mystery. You know that therapists are you know these m mystical creatures that you know talk to you a certain way. Uh, a lot of people think therapists are the same as psychiatrists or, you know, doctors that they've had in their past. So they feel anxious about reaching out to a therapist. So I think by me allowing myself to connect in these types of forums, people are able to see that I'm a therapist and I have a sense of humor and, and I'm able to, to just talk normal. There's no fancy terms that are coming out of my mouth. And I think that when people see that, they kind of can, can feel like, oh, I would feel comfortable with her or someone like her, or you know, if there, there's a man that is like this, I would feel comfortable with him. So it's taking away that mysticism that you know, therapy makes, uh, therapists uh, or, or therapy is something odd or difficult or you know, uncomfortable. The other thing is by continuing to educate people that mental health is something that everyone at some point in their life may have to contend with. For example, mm -hmm. I have a female clients or friends that are females that have dealt with depression after having children, or they've dealt with anxiety after getting married or moving to a new location. Uh, as we shared before, all of the people that have been going through mental health symptoms because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the uncertainty, you know, in the United States, that, that election that happened this, you know, November was mental health, a, a crisis for a lot of Americans, because we were in perpetual fear of what was going to happen. And, and, you know, yesterday I was watching um, a documentary. I don't know if you know the, the he's an artist. His name is Jay Balvin. He's a very famous reggaeton artist. He's won more than eight Grammys. And during his documentary, he was talking about his battle with depression. And I was surprised, you know, and I said, I'm, I'm so happy that as a Latino man, he is talking about this and also normalizing how you can be very wealthy. You can be young, you can be attractive. You can have a nice girlfriend and homes in multiple countries and still have depression. 
but yet you can still find a way to function and make people happy if you get help. So I think that encouraging people to see by role models um, and by normalizing therapy, it's, it's the same as going to the dentist. You know, if you have a toothache, you go to the dentist. If you have some emotional concern, call a therapist. It's the same concept. You know, if you have a stomach ache, you go to your doctor, same concept. You know, if you're sad because, you know, you lost your job or you lost a loved one, call, call someone, seek help. So that's, that's really the, the way that I try to address it, normalizing this, that all of us at some point are going to need help. And it's absolutely normal. And the sooner we treat it, the sooner we can get back to having productive, happy lives. And also, again, uh, there's lots of awareness being created. Uh, if you need uh, a therapist or a counselor, do not call 911, because again, that's an ongoing um, issue. In fact, when we celebrated uh, Mental Health Month, uh, that's something which many therapists, counselors who are trying to create that awareness uh, also spoke about uh, in terms of Mental Health America. But thank you so much, Madeline. Um, yes, Neha. Uh, so yeah, we were talking about individuals now and now about it, but uh, this, uh, many of our problems come from uh, outside, right? The structure itself. So like, I'm sure you wanted to like what made put like um yeah so we need to God, where am I going with this? sorry uh, so yeah what uh, so what got you interested in program management and development because uh, did you how did you get aware that there's a societal structural problem yeah. well i've been blessed that i am in new york city i'm a born and raised new yorker and so i've gotten to see how you can have communities that have nothing or appear to have nothing. And then right next door is a community that seems to have everything. You know, I don't, I don't know if you've been to New York City, but you know, I call them invisible lines. You know, if you're going to Manhattan or Manhattan pre-COVID, we know that upper Manhattan is more poor. Yeah, and then there's an invisible line around 92nd Street, East and West Side. Below that, that's where the money starts to, to exist. The stores become very nice. There's doormen in buildings. You know, the cars parked on the street are fancy cars, if they're even parked on the street, because now you have garages that are $50 a day. And so growing up in a city that you see wealth and poverty collide every day and coexist, I became very aware of, you know, how, do, how is it that there's an invisible line? Why? why is it that this neighborhood is safe, but across the street is not safe? And so that, that got me very interested in, in systems. And, and going to social work school, that's what they, they train you in. They train you in understanding how systems affect the people living in them and also can create some of the problems. You know, in the last year here, we've seen the legal system, how the legal system um, mm-hmm. and the mental health system have collided where a lot of people with mental health problems have been victims of police brutality um, because there's just a lack of understanding. And mm-hmm. there's, there's still a fear that if somebody is mentally ill and is having a mental health breakdown, that they're dangerous or they're out of control. The statistics have proven that that is false, but people still believe that to be true. So seeing these things happening around me, I became very keenly aware that I wanted to make a difference. And seeing clients as an individual therapist, of course, I make a difference in the lives of those people. But in terms of making a bigger impact and and being able to think as a social work leader, being able to lead systems and organizations that affect systems is the way to go. So if I'm training and leading a staff of 200 therapists, those are 200 people that will now impact how many hundreds and, and thousands of clients in one year's time. You know, I'm, I'm teaching part-time at Fordham University. I'm training the next generation of social workers every year. So mm-hmm. as long as I can do this, how many groups of social workers will learn some of the things that will help them to make an impact and then they're gonna mm-hmm. impact clients. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's a network marketing model in social work. That's the way I see it. You know, it's promoting what I know and helping people to, to repeat this with other people. And that's how you truly can make an impact in systems. 
one one person is not enough. And also, I have this uh, another question, Madeline. Before uh, Sneha takes over with another one, uh, uh, as an adjunct professor at, uh, at Fordham University, um, what's your advice to people uh, who uh, face the challenges with their licensure exam? I, I know lots of depressed people, as in uh, I see lots of them in um, the social media networks, uh, be it in LinkedIn groups or Facebook groups. Um, some of them miss with one mark or probably a couple of them miss their uh, licensure exam with five to 10 marks. And even after four to five attempts, what is your advice to them? My advice first and foremost is to really understand that how well you do on that test is not an indicator of how good a social worker or clinician you are going to be. Because a lot of times we internalize, well, I failed that test or I didn't pass that test. I must not be able to do this profession or maybe this is some sort of sign. So I tell my colleagues because I've supervised clinicians who have failed the test by just a few points or some by a lot. And I say, this is a standardized test like any other standardized test. You know, in, in high school, we took the SAT to get into college. That's a standardized test. The license exam is a standardized test. It's measuring how well you can memorize information and how well you can answer multiple choices. Yeah. Worker can learn how to pass that licensing exam if they're trained. So I tell all my colleagues, do not forego training and practicing for that test. You have to do a boot camp or some kind of um, training with a, an organization that knows how to train social workers to pass that exam. I have a colleague um, who does a social work boot camp. That's what she calls it. And uh, she's a PhD and she trains social workers on how to pass the exam. A lot of people get, get test anxiety or, you know, they're just not good under pressure. They know the information, but when they're watching a clock and clicking, it's it's not a ideal situation, but it doesn't mean that they cannot do this profession. So I don't give up, get a good training uh, or a good trainer, a tutor, you know, whatever we want to call it and, and try again, because at some point they're going to pass the exam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline, for sharing that. Yes, Neha. Oh, yeah. In a, in a city of multicultural New York, uh, there might be like a lot of, you know, cultural tensions and like there's there is a lot of and problems are intersectional, right? So, I mean, how do you deal with that? There must be so much, like and uh, the the like the political spectrum, right? Like there there must be different ideas on how to deal with the mental health and even how important mental health even is in the first place. How do you, you know, the, how do you manage all of that? Like how do you unify them and make both sides of the aisle understand that, you know, hey, mental health is important and I do need, we do need to solve this. How do you, you know, unify people despite their differences? I think that the first thing that we all need to do is to stop trying to put people in boxes and, and assigning labels. You know, we saw that a lot here with, um, you know, you're a Trumper, you're, you know, I got called all kinds of, you know, names because, you know, of my, it's not surprising. I was not pro-Trump, everyone. It's okay. And, you know, if you look at my social media, you figured that out quickly. So, but I, I've been around people who, you know, have felt very strongly about either political views or, you know, the things that uh, this city has gone through with the police. And I think that we need to, first and foremost, look at each other, really look at each other's faces and, and try to connect as human beings. You know, before you're a policeman, before you're a therapist, before you're a pro-Trumper or pro-Biden or a Democrat or Republican, you're human beings. And right. having conversations with people. You know, I went to a barbecue last uh, September uh, <laughs> where I was surrounded by pro-Trump police officers who were uh, there because one of my family members is a police officer and he supported Trump. He's a Republican. And um, inside I said, this is my nightmare come true. But then I said, 
you know, this is your family. Before Trump even existed, this is your family. Relax, enjoy, talk to people. And they asked me a lot of questions, you know, but we were able to have a dialogue and I was able to explain, you know, wh why I think the way I think. They explained why they feel the way they feel. Some of their points were very valid. And so I, I just brought things up and said, you know, did you know this? Did you know about that? You know, do you know that there, there really is a myth that mentally ill people are dangerous? And this is why sometimes the police overreact. You know, I, I just brought up conversational points. And I think if we could do that without getting angry, without resorting to yelling, it, it allows us to say, well, I still don't support Trump, mm -hmm. but I like some of the people who I met who do support Trump. And just like, you know, I've been a proponent of reorganizing, restructuring the policing in America, I have police officers that are good friends of mine that come to my home, eat meals, and I support them. And I do not support, you know, them losing their jobs or having people hurt them in any way. So it's, it's about connecting as, as humans and not just, you know, policies and, and labels and those things are divisive in nature. Awesome, Madeline. Again, you have proven that um, mental health is, again, the real wealth. Uh, looking at the human side, um, not just uh, about what the society or the environment had created uh, among us. Again, um, people uh, say that at the front line, it's always the doctors, nurses, but behind their back, there's lots of work being done by therapists, counselors, because you create the thoughts and feelings in the, uh, in the patients and everybody who needs. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing about what you do for um, the police as the frontline workers or be it the uh, people who are working on creating the discipline among the society uh, and other citizens out there. Uh, yeah, Sneha. Anything else? Yeah, I the questions today is so like lovely to you know hear your perspective on things. It was really enlightening. Uh, thank you for being with us. Was, yeah. So, and Raj, do you have any questions? Yeah, about the the questions. only thing which I would ask Madeline is again. Uh, um, I know with the kind of busy schedules, with the kind of workflow which you have, the calendar is filled with whatever you do in terms of private practice probably doing the best which you can do for the community or for everybody who tries to get in touch with you. Uh, I understand that we are all managing our personal and professional lives. Do you have any last piece of advice for uh, therapists, counselors, or uh, aspiring therapists or counselors? Uh, because if you were 18, what would you say to yourself to be where you are today right now? Wow, that's a very profound question. Um, I would tell myself that I'm gonna impact more people than I ever thought possible. And I'm going to have opportunities to um, lead and make changes in, in social work and, and programs in ways that I never would think were possible um, as a young social worker. So to prepare myself and to not allow people to make me feel like I can't because I'm younger or inexperienced or because of where I come from. Um, you know, as a, as a Latina woman, daughter of immigrant parents, um, I was still a minority when I went to social work school and I'm still a minority. We're, we have more diversity in the social work field, but we are not the majority by far and wide. And so I would remind myself that as that, person who comes from an other group, I'm going to make really amazing changes in this field. And I'm still gonna love it 20 years later. When I first started, I, I didn't know if I would still be here 20 years later. Um, now I know that this is really what I'm meant to do. And um, I'm gonna be doing it till I'm no longer here. But uh, when I first started, I wasn't so sure my first two years. <laughs> I wasn't sure I would last uh, four years in social work. It's, it's very difficult, it's overwhelming. And yeah. you know, there's a lot of, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. So uh, I, would, I would encourage anyone who's, who's thinking about this field, 
If this is your passion, do it. It's an amazing profession that will take you in a lot of different directions if, if you work hard and you're open to opportunities. For those that are already in it, you have to uh, find where you fit. Find where you fit. You know, sometimes we're in the wrong agency, the wrong job, the wrong uh, type of, of work for us within the mental health world. But if we just make a move, you know, use a company like Direct Shifts, for example, you know, to help find a better, a better fit. You'd be surprised, you know, you could hate this job and you get into the right job or right organization, you're thriving. So I encourage people to not turn against social work or against the profession of mental health and instead to see that maybe they need to find where they fit within that field. Awesome. End of the day, if it's uh, something which we are passionate about, it doesn't feel like work, like the way you put it across. So definitely it takes lots of patience, lots of listening. Uh, I've got one last question before we end this live. Uh, Madeline, this would be, again, something probably um, the tip. Again, what's your best tip for making the world a better place? Or... Huh. That's an easy one. Love one another. That's okay. it. I love people. That's my secret sauce. I love people. And I think it comes out. You know, if I'm at the supermarket, <laughs> people talk to me. If I'm walking my dog, people talk to me. I think when you love people, it shows in your face. It, you know, it comes out as energetically. You know, for those that are spiritual, that's a biblical principle. For those that are not, uh, you know, religious or Christian, it's, it's just an energetic principle. You know, the, the universe, you put love out there. You love people it comes back to you. And if you lead with that, clients are never going to abuse you or mistreat you. And you will find your fit. You will find yeah. your fit. You reminded me of uh, Amazon CEO again, uh, Jeff Bissos, who says, <laughs> always love your customers. Uh, yes. Again, you you read like always love people. That's, that's again, yeah. uh, leveling up. Thank you so much, Madeline. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. you. Again, we'll share the recording with you. Uh, again, uh, for anybody out there who, who might catch this replay, they'll be able to find this on Apple and Google podcast. We'll share you the links. We'll drop you another email. Uh, once again, I, big thank you for uh, being with us for last 40, 45 minutes or close to one hour now. And uh, thank you, Sneha. It was an amazing session, and Goodbye. we'll and we'll we'll catch you with another episode of Direct Shift Stories um, next week. And until then, thank you so much. Thank you. It was wonderful. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.